We are going to be looking at understanding anxiety. It's an introduction for parents. The presenters today are myself. My name is Liz. This is Vicky and we also have Bex who will also be joining us today. Um, just a couple of points. There is no camera or chat facility today. The webinar is going to be recorded and we will share it afterwards along with any resources that we refer to during the webinar. If you do have any specific queries or questions, our contact details will be provided at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to get in contact with us. If you do require crisis support, then the telephone number for the crisis for the 24 hour response team is listed on the front page. But again, there will be some contact numbers at the end of the webinar. So who are we? We are the Mental Health Support Team, also known as MHST. We are an NHS service providing mental health support to primary schools and secondary schools in St Helens, Warrington, Nosley and Holton. We aim to help young people learn strategies and new ways of caring for their mental health. We provide interventions to people struggling with anxiety, low mood or behavioural difficulties. And in addition, we also deliver talks like we are doing today. Today's agenda, we are going to be looking at what anxiety is and the flight, fight, freeze response. We're going to look at understanding how we can get stuck in the anxiety cycle and we're going to look at how you can talk to your anxious child in addition to strategies to support them with their anxiety. OK, so we're going to go start off by thinking about what is anxiety. Um, I'm going to play a short video uh, which will explain a bit more. Just got a We're all different, and there are many different feelings we can experience at different times. Some are more well-known than others, such as excitement or anger, but some can be harder to understand, like anxiety. Millions of years ago, we relied on anxiety to keep us out of harm's way. At the slightest sign of danger, our bodies would bring on this uneasy, urgent feeling to jolt us into action or get us to run away. These days, our bodies still try to protect us, but life's evolved. There are loads more things to worry about, and they have a habit of piling up without us noticing. Anxiety can feel like all kinds of things. That twisted, shaky feeling in your stomach, or the strange nervousness that makes you want to hide away from the world. It can make you tired, frustrated and upset. Anxiety can start as a simple worry, but grow into a panic, and convince you that you're losing it altogether. It can make you scared, restless, speed up your heart, but give you no explanations as to why it's happening. It might not feel like it, but anxiety is completely natural and can affect anybody for all kinds of reasons, like exam stress, family troubles, new places, or a mixture of things. It can even come for no apparent reason, but the good news is that you can reduce it, and the first step is to talk about it. Talking about how you feel is a great way to feel better. You don't have to face things alone, so if you ever want to get stuff off your chest, then you can contact Childline. They're there to listen. Okay, so as the video sort of shared, you know, anxiety is a normal emotion, um, you know, and sometimes the triggers are unclear. Uh, so we've shared this slide about developmental stages just to normalise that certain worries and fears are more prevalent at certain ages. For example, sort of around five to seven years, you often get young people are having more increased um, fears around sort of illnesses and death. And 12 to 18 years, uh, a lot more fears centred around peer rejection and world issues, uh, which is just just to be mindful of when they're watching the news a lot and things like that. Really. And we'll share this slide with yourselves. So, as I said, anxiety is a normal emotion and the right amounts can be useful. It can help motivate us and get us to do things we want to do. And there's three main sort of characteristics that we'll sort of focus on. First, the sort of physical sensations in the body that young people and adults experience, um, and that's associated with that adrenaline kicking in, preparing the body for action. 
um, and they'll get you know normal symptoms, sort of sweating, heart beating faster, shaking, feeling hot, um, and such like, uh, activating that sort of fight, flight, freeze response. The next component is sort of anxious thoughts and um, overestimating danger and underestimating their ability to cope. Um, and the third aspect is behaviour. So behaviour aims at helping the child anticipate or avoid future danger, for example, looking out for, for threats and for danger, being a bit hypervigilant um, and avoiding situations that they're fearful of. And anxiety occurs in all of us, parents included. So just to discuss a bit more about the fight, flight, freeze response um, and just really to normalise as well, you know, that after we don't choose which which response we want, it just our body automatically sort of goes into it. Or, so when we're in fight and fight, when we're in, sorry, when we're in flight mode, children may react in a way that we see as aggressive. They may hit out more, throw things, shout, swear, hurt themselves or fight with peers. When in flight mode, children may react in a way that we see as avoiding and we might say things like, you know, plead with them to leave situations um, or they might walk, run away. The, you know, complaining of illnesses, stomach aches, headaches to try and avoid leaving the house, um, escaping to a safe, safe place such as the bathroom or bedroom or caregivers. Um, when in freeze mode, children may react in a way that Others might see as ignorant or rude, or we can worry that that might come across that way. They may refuse to answer questions or join family activities. They get them might hide under bed, the bed or furniture, or they may refuse to get out of the car uh, and refuse to leave caregivers. Um, okay. So that brings us on to think a little bit more about the anxiety cycle. So it's really important before we think about strategies that you start to think a bit more about sort of how your child or your young person uh, might be stuck in their cycle. Um, as Vic has already said, the cycle is like uh, made up of those anxious thoughts and those anxious um, behaviours um, and each of them sort of impact each other. What we do know though uh, from sort of working with anxiety is that there are often sort of several common maintenance factors that do keep somebody, not just a young person, but like anybody within their anxiety cycle. So that often falls down to the things that that person does for themselves to try to protect themselves from that sort of perceived danger. Danger. And then it also is down to things that other people might do around them to try to help that sort of distressed person in that moment. So again, for the child, if they're anxious, those um, thoughts are going to be maintaining some of that anxiety, underestimating um, their coping skills and overestimating the danger that they're in. They're going to misinterpret some of those physical symptoms of anxiety that Vicky mentions. So as soon as their heart starts to go really fast or uh, they feel a little bit sick, they're going to start to then think, oh, something bad is happening, something is wrong with me. And then that's going to lead them to maybe display some anxious behaviour, such as avoidance or seeking reassurance from other people around them. Again, that is all sort of keeping that young person in the cycle. We then look at what other people might be doing um, to also contribute to this young person staying in the cycle. When we say others, that's not just yourselves as parent carers, it's also sort of teachers, um, siblings, other family members, anybody around that young person. Now, obviously, if you see a young person in distress, you might be doing some of these things but we're asking you to think a little bit more with like a anxiety hat on for a moment and just think about how some of these factors might be affecting the cycle so you yourself or other people around the young person might also struggle with anxiety and so naturally demonstrate some anxious behavior um, you might uh, want to protect and become very involved uh, when you see your child in distress. Again, understandably so. We're going to come on to that a little bit later. But we're, we're also asking you to maybe reflect a little bit and think about, is that maybe too much? Um, is that contributing to the cycle? Um, again, we, will, we might reassure them um, or we might sort of not encourage them to try new things, knowing that they're going to get in an anxious state. Um, again, it's sort of some 
points to just sort of be mindful of in terms of what can maintain the cycle. I am going to give you a little bit of a, a sort of a demonstration now so you can see what we mean by this sort of maintenance cycle. So this is a example um, of a family um, it's a really common example that a lot of our team like work with sort of daily, but this is an example of a family that I've worked with. So this is about Isla um, and Amy. Isla is seven years old and she experiences some difficulties with separating from mum, particularly at the school gates and when going upstairs alone. So it, typically in a session with a parent, the first step we would do is try to explore this maintenance cycle um, a little bit more. So. I asked mum to think about a sort of a really typical recent situation and mum discussed the fact that often in the mornings when she asks Isla to get her bag from upstairs or anything from upstairs, she'll often refuse. I asked for mum to think about what Isla's anxious thoughts were in that moment. You know, what is it that we think Isla is, is worried about? Um, so mum said that up until this point, Isla had just talked about this monster coming to get her, um, that she couldn't go up alone, that she needed somebody to be with her. I asked mum to then think about how these anxious thoughts make Isla feel, um, understandably upset, sort of anxious, worried. And then in that moment, I asked for mum to sort of think about um, what is it that Isla does. Um, and that's quite clear for mum to see that in these moments she'll refuse to go upstairs. She might start to cry or become a bit whingy. You might see some of those fight, flight, freeze symptoms that Vicky mentioned, um, shouting or hitting out even. For Isla, it was more like they found themselves in a bit of the sort of a shouting um, sort of situation. I then asked mum to think a bit about the other people around Isla. So when Isla was acting like this, what was she thinking because she happened to be the person around Isla or what was other people thinking at the time? So mum talked about the fact that um, she noticed some anxious thoughts herself, um, anxious that they're going to be late for school. Um, she might then be late for, for work. Also some thoughts which totally understandable in the sense of thinking that, you know, this needs to stop, Isla needs to stop being so silly and this can't keep going on forever. In the moment, mum herself felt quite frustrated. Um, she felt a little bit grumpy and she also felt that anxiety thinking, you know, is this always going to be the way that it's going to be? And in that situation, mum did talk about the fact that when Isla shouted, she often then um, shouted and raised her voice as well, which led to her feeling a little bit guilty um, for that. Um, but ultimately, in these situations, mum would go upstairs with Isla uh, to get a bag or she'd send one of Isla's sort of siblings to go up with her. And I asked mum to then think about what is this telling Isla's anxious mind? And sort of from drawing it out together, mum talked about the fact that she was only safe because um, her mum was with her. So this is what Isla was thinking, this is what this is telling sort of Isla's anxious mind, that she's only safe because her mum was with her. The monsters would have got me if she wasn't there. This can then obviously lead on to different thoughts, such as, you know, what if the monster gets me? I need to keep her safe. Uh, what if mum gets taken and I'm in school? Uh, what if I never see her again? Obviously, up until this point, though, this is me just asking what mum thinks Isla is thinking. So we're going to come on to a little bit in a second about how to actually get that from the young person themselves. Um, but when we do the cycle, it's really important to remember in the sense of how this can maintain the anxiety, because what we know about somebody who is anxious is that they often overestimate the danger. So she believed there was a monster upstairs and she underestimated her ability to cope with this. So she felt she had to have somebody with her because that monster was too scary for her to deal with alone. We know that anxious people often look out for evidence to confirm that their thoughts are correct. So because in this situation, mum often goes with her or sends somebody up with Isla to go with her, her anxious brain is saying to herself that mum had to come with me, so I knew I couldn't do it alone. I knew the monster would have got me. And what we know is that anxious people often make conclusions from this evidence, which ultimately keeps them in their cycle. So after a while, once this sort of situation repeats over and over again, sort of Isla's anxious mind is concluding that she's only safe if somebody is with her, which then keeps her in the cycle, feeling anxious and continuing to avoid going upstairs alone 
or just generally continuing to struggle like leaving mum like separating at the school gates. At this point, I'll always ask the parent, what is it therefore that their young person, their child needs to learn? So for Isla, uh, mum concluded that really Isla needed to learn that there wasn't a monster, that she could cope and that she was safe um, and she didn't need mum to stay with her. After this webinar, we are going to send out like a blank version of that um, cycle that I just showed you. And it is really good to spend a bit of time just drawing out your child's anxiety cycle, figuring out what is it that they're getting stuck with and then what is it that they need to learn. As we said all along, reassurance is completely natural in this situation. Obviously, if you see a child in distress, any of us, us included, would want to reassure that young person and to make them feel safe. Again, thinking just about anxiety, though, people who are anxious, not just anxious children, but anxious adults as well, seek out reassurance. They underestimate their ability to cope, so they always want to check in with somebody to make sure that they're doing the right thing or that they're safe. But what we do know about reassurance is that it can be very addictive. So the more that Isla was getting, the more she wanted it or the more she thought she needed it in order to be able to cope. So a lot of our strategies are going to be trying to get you to think about how to respond slightly differently to slowly decrease the amount of reassurance that you're giving in a way that feels comfortable for both you and your young person. Which brings us on to talking about um, sort of anxiety with your child. Again, this is a really important step before we move into strategies. Until we know what your child is anxious about, then we don't know what they need to learn. That cycle is just uh, mum's sort of, or your um, sort of thoughts about what you think your child might be anxious about. But we also know children are children and they can be thinking totally different things to what us as adults are thinking. So these are just some top tips about how to basically get the most out of your child, how to have those conversations, how to make them feel validated and heard and normalise some of that anxiety. This will be sent out as well in the pack that we'll send with the webinar. Um, and Vicky and Liz have kindly done a little bit of a demonstration for us. Um, so in the video, you'll see um, Liz um, is playing Isla and Vicky is playing Mum in this. And Vicky's just going to demonstrate some of these questions so you can see a little bit about what it actually looks like. Do you mind if I ask you about, you know, the other day when you got a bit upset before school? What were you sort of worrying about? Oh, no. I just wondered if potentially, you know, you were worrying about being scared of the dark or... No, I'm not scared of the dark anymore. Oh, well, that's good, is it? What, what, were you worrying about anything else? Because I know at one point you were sort of worrying about monsters and things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it yeah. monsters? Yeah. yeah. So what, what, is that what went through your mind yesterday when I was saying about going upstairs to get your bag? Yeah, it might get me. You're worried about the monster getting you? Yeah. Oh, so I can understand, I don't know, did that, is that what made you feel upset and frightened? Yeah, it made my tummy feel funny and it made my heart go fast. Well, I can understand, you know, if, if, if you felt a monster was going to get you, you're getting those horrible symptoms, like, you know why you not want to go up, oh, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think we could do to help you when you're feeling like that? If you just go up with me. Okay, so you can think of when you are there. Do you think it's just there sort of when, when you're on your own? Yeah. Do you worry that the monster's going to harm you then? Or? Yeah, it's going to get me. So it sounds like your worry is if you're on your own that the monster will get you and Oh yeah, really feel safer than, than the adults with you. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, I don't like going upstairs on my own. Oh, I really, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. It helps to sort of help you then, doesn't it? And think how we could work this out together. Thank you both for sort of recording that for us. But hopefully that was a, a demonstration that showed you sort of a little bit. Vic was starting off by sort of checking out um, sort of what she was thinking Isla like, might be worried about. So is it the dark? Um, 
of which quickly I have responded, no, that's not right. And sort of, so it led for Vicar, playing the mum, to be able to ask some of the questions, to check her understanding, to validate that feeling. Um, you know, like, I, of course, it's going to worry you, you know, if I was in your shoes then, um, and I thought there was a monster, that, that would be scary. And trying to normalise some of that. Our biggest tip when talking to anxious children is to pick your moment. So if they are in a fight, flight, freeze response, they're not in um, any sort of state to be able to rationalise and reason and understand the questions that you're going to be asking for them. So it might be after the event, once they've calmed down, maybe the next day on the drive to school, sort of a much more relaxed day that you're able to actually have these questions and don't be afraid to ask the questions as well until we ask the questions and we don't know sort of what they're worried about until we don't know what they're worried about we don't know what they need to sort of learn and we're going to move on to strategies we are we are so we're going to go and think about you know when we're asking young people to face their fears in this gradual step way what strategies you can use to sort of support them throughout that testing out process. So the first first step would be just normalising anxiety and sort of teaching them about anxiety. There's a good video that was shared the link to on YouTube that you could watch um, with your child um, and just sort of acknowledge that these symptoms are very pleasant and they can, you know, be uncomfortable, but they're the normal responses to anxiety and that together you can get through them. The next strategy we would encourage you to try to use with your child is the worry tree. Um, it's just a way of looking at your looking at the worries together, working out uh, which worries your young person can sort of let go of, and which ones, you know, you can make a do a bit of problem solving and make a plan with together. Um, we will send this this leaflet out and. Uh, I guess it, it, it could also be helpful to sort of model using that because we want them to have this skill and to learn to use it with you and alongside you um, and normalise so that we can do this. Another strategy we would encourage is that problem solving of the here, here and now real worries. All children have to face difficult situations at one time or another. And sometimes, you know, children's worries are realistic and we may want to solve the problems for them ourselves. And because, you know, I can appreciate, you know, sometimes it's easier to do that, especially when, you know, we'll have to get busy. But I guess then they don't learn that skill. So we want, you know, we'll send out the, the sheet that you can do it with them to think about what possible options and what solutions there are to the real stresses or the real problems that they've got. Think of the pros and cons of them, pick a plan which is doable and then rate how good that plan is and just go for it and do it with them. So as they get older, they will like learn more independence and teach them skills to, to, to learn how to problem solve themselves with adult support. Okay, another strategy we would recommend trying is use of worry time. This is where you set a time to go through worries together. So we want the young person just to know any worries that they get in the day, put them either in a notepad or a worry jar or a worry monster. And the aim of this is that we're, we're teaching them a new skill. Um, if, and we're trying to get them to catch the worries so that then we can look at them and work out which ones they can let go of, go of which ones are sort of what if worries that might not 100% happen and which ones are real problems that we have you have to do the sort of problem solving approach to um, and once they've done that worry time it'd be doing things sort of to distract them or, and let them sort of process everything and, and move on um, so we're going to show you a bit of a video, um, a short video explaining a bit more about this technique and how to I'm use it. I was wondering, do you think it's just the time that we set, wasn't it, to, you know, when we agreed about the worry time, would it be all right if we start working through your worries together, do you think? Yeah, of course. Yeah? Do you want to do, you're in charge of that again now, do you, what do you think would be the best one at a time and, and we can look at it? Thinking about the worry tree? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did a good job there. Don't worry about being late for school. Okay, well, should we put this on and sort of do that one first? Is that, is that all right? Yeah. So, go on, what can you remember? Where, where should we start? So, notice your worries, so you've done that, haven't you? 
um, and asked yourself what are you worrying about? So Sophie was late for school and she walked into school and everybody turned and looked at her and I don't want to be late for school. So you just worried about coming in late and everybody looking and and just 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 it, uh, did they say anything to her or was it no, just for just, they just to her and Miss just said, Sophie, just go and sit down. So, is this a worry that you can do something about, do you think, then? Because we're trying to work out which, is it, is it a what if worry or a here and now one? I think if I get up a bit early, and if I, if maybe if I get my things ready the night before. Yeah, and you're good at doing that, aren't you? You've been doing that. Yeah, that well. Um, yeah. So, my breakfast a bit quicker. Yeah, so maybe having a bit of a short breakfast, getting your stuff ready. Yeah. And you think that if we do that, and we've, we've been doing that, haven't we? Because we haven't been late. No. So we have you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you think we can let that sort of worry go then? Yeah. Yeah, I think we can. So do you want to do the honours and scrunch it up? Or are you ripping it up? What are you doing? I'll scrunch it up and try and throw it in. Nice one. Ooh. Oh, you did, you did good there. Um, yeah, go on to the next one. Good one. Oh. Might tell me for this one. Come on, come on, we'll work it out together. I'm worried because I don't have the food for tomorrow and we're making something in class tomorrow. It's like you need to, yeah. to tell you. Well, you know, this is this is good that we can talk about it and worry time and then sit and think. So, so we do need it for tomorrow. Yeah. So we can't really just let that one go, can we? Do you reckon? I've got the list in my bag. Okay. So, so that is a here and now worry, do you agree? Yeah. Because if we, if, you know, it is something we can do about. So what, what do you think we can do about it then? We can get the list from your bag. Can we go to the shop? We could go to the shop. We could look what's in the cupboards first as well, couldn't we? Any other yeah. options, do you think? We might be able to go next door and see if they've got anything. Yeah, yeah, the cupboards are brilliant, aren't they, stuff? So yeah, so basically we'll have to go through the list together, do you think? Yeah, and have a look and see what we've got. We'll make that plan and then we'll just do it. And then do you think you can let that worry go? Yeah, once we've got the things. <sighs> go on then. Thank you. No, thank you for, for telling me and now we can sort it out, can't we? Good on you, not to worry. No. Pause it there. So hopefully, like again, thank you for the demonstration, uh, Liz and Vic, but that showed you that skill of worry time that Vicky said, and um, it's really, it can be a bit of a sort of a, a strange strategy to begin with. It's not sort of a natural way that we um, manage our worries all the time, but it is a really effective strategy that just requires like a bit of practice to sort of get into the habit of. What we would also recommend is just generally promoting the independence of young people. So that could be just like in the example of worry time, it could be like getting the young person to be popping in the worries for themselves rather than you like writing them down for them is like a really good sort of first off. But the reason we want to promote independence is because we know that children who are quite anxious also often find that um, they're less confident in their themselves. Again, they overestimate that danger and they underestimate that ability to cope. Um, so it's really important that we're encouraging them to have a go at things and tell themselves that they can do this. On the right there, you'll see some suggested activities um, that are age appropriate. Um, some of these might um, be suitable, some of them might not be, but just some suggestions to think about it. Um, common ones from the families that I've worked with are things like uh, feeding family pets, um, watering like plants or in the garden, setting the table for tea. So anything like that that they could start doing uh, that you can really praise and reward them for and really just build up that confidence that they can um, do things by themselves. That is a really important step, which then leads you into encouraging them to face their fears um, and sort of take on a, a strategy that we use in any of our worry management interventions, which is called graded exposure. So we know that people who are anxious, not just children, but anyone with anxiety, often avoids things that makes them feel anxious. The more we avoid things, the more anxious we become. So we've got to face that fear in order to show ourselves that the danger wasn't as scary as we thought it was gonna be, and that actually we coped and that we were okay. 
obviously some fears though can be too overwhelming um, like learning to swim we don't want to just jump in the deep end we need to start in the shallow end build up our confidence to then go into the deep end so in order to do this we create what we call a step-by-step -step plan so first of all you've got to identify what it is that they want to face what fear that is um, which brings you back to what I spoke about earlier about what is it they need to learn. You need to then think about, OK, so if that's what they need to learn, what would that ultimate goal be? And then break that goal into sort of smaller steps, around six to ten steps, put in those steps in order of least to most difficult and giving them rewards as they go to sort of praise um, all of the hard work that they've put into facing their fear. I'm going to give you an example now just so you can make sense of, of what I'm explaining here. So thinking back to Isla, we know that Isla in anxious thought is that she's only safe if somebody is with her and that she needs to learn that she can cope on her own, that there's no monster and that she'll be safe. So her ultimate goal would be to go upstairs on her own sort of independently. In this situation, I would then get sort of parents to, um, just as I've, as I've explained, order sort of different tasks from least to most feared and think of these rewards to go for each step. The rewards, I would stress, don't have to be monetary at all. It can just be about quality time with your child. Um, we're not trying to bribe them. We're trying to just reward them for like all the things that they've been doing and involve them in that conversation. What rewards would they like? And it could be a small as going to the park or picking the film that you watch for family film night, uh, baking the cake together, you know, anything like that. Um, so for Isla, her graded exposure sort of step by step plan might look a bit like this. So she might, her first sort of step um, at the bottom here, she might go upstairs with mum to get a school bag with mum waiting on the landing. Her next step, same situation, but mum now is waiting midway on the stairs and then mum is waiting at the bottom of the stairs and so on. As you can see with each step, the space and time between Isla and mum um, is gradually increasing. So mum is moving further and further away from Isla and Isla is spending more time on her own uh, facing her fears. This graded exposure ladder works for any type of anxiety, not just separation anxiety. Um, so for example, if your child is just generally anxious, they dislike uncertainty and they like lots of routine, that ladder might look something like this. Again, we're going from the least to the most feared. Uh, we're involving the child in these discussions and in what rewards they would like. Some steps might need to be repeated a few times. That's absolutely fine. Again, it's about building the confidence. If they move to the next step and it's too much for them, um, it's OK to add extra steps in. Um, this is something that can change. Um, it's not sort of set in stone. And if you're not sure where to start, my best advice would be to just get a bunch of post-it notes, write down anything and everything that they're sort of currently avoiding um, and then order them together um, in least to most feared. All the strategies we've talked about today especially this graded exposure, like step-by-step -step plan, is included in this book here on the right, Helping Your Child with Fears and Worries by Kathy Creswell. Um, it is the book that our parent-led intervention is based upon. You're welcome to sort of um, get a copy for yourselves. Uh, we're not linked in any way to the book, so we're not making any money, but Kathy is certainly making some. It's an excellent book. Um, all the parents that I've worked with do absolutely love reading this. Um, it is available um, on Spotify and Audible as well, if you'd rather listen sort of in the car on the way to work or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you've got any more questions around that, that is your go-to sort of uh, book. And we will be sending you a blank copy of like a ladder so you can have a go with your child. Okay, so moving on, when, when you know, obviously you're asking your child to face it is, we know that they might experience unpleasant symptoms and might get a bit upset. And I guess as, a, as the parents, we're, we're asking you to sort of help them by help encourage them to try and relax and do these sort of techniques to help them through it rather than avoid. Um, so the techniques that we'd recommend could be could involve anything from sort of mindfulness techniques, breathing techniques, grounding, meditation or, you know, doing th active things together like going for a walk. Um, so a lot of these can be found on YouTube and we will send some resources out to yourselves after the webinar.
and also importantly you know it's important as parents to look after yourself too and think about your self-care and your backup team because you can't pour for an empty cup you know and obviously we're asking you to support young people with anxiety so please get that support if you if you need it yourselves as well because we all need help at some times And in summary, statistically, anxiety is prevalent in a large number of young people. By reducing reassurance and increasing independence, young people can start to challenge their anxiety and face their fears. And parents you know, do a brilliant job by helping them and considering the steps and strategies that we've discussed today to encourage that independence and for them to give it a go. And we've had great success when these sort of strategies have been followed and put into place. As Vic said, you can't pour for in, from an empty cup. So here is some support options for you as parents. There is a code there for our website. Please feel free to, to use it and have a look on the MHST website. In addition, there is the, some other support. There's the Mental Health Foundation, there's Mind, there's the NHS website, there's Young Minds Parent Helpline, there's Adult IAPT, and we've listed all the numbers for, for the different areas, Advanced Solutions, and there are some parent carer forums that you can access as well. Support for young people, we've listed our number at the top. So as we said at the beginning, if you do have any queries or questions, please make contact with us. There's a telephone number there as well for Warrington Cams, Halton Cams, St Helens and Knowsley. There's the 24 hour response team as well and Mersey Care's 24 hour crisis line. In addition, you can access support from Childline, Young Minds, Papyrus and beatandcooth.com so thank you so much for listening we do really appreciate you you tuning in um, and we will be really grateful if you could give us feedback about the, about the presentation today we have we are running some some more well-being webinars and the next one is later on this month and it is on low mood so thank you so much for coming in have a lovely evening thank, thank you everyone